Hello. <clears throat> Hello, Amanda. Hello, Jesse. Morning. Morning. I may not be able to say a whole lot until a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, but I'll be around. I'm kind of limited in my ability to speak here. Okay. For, um, maybe like 30 or so minutes. All right. But I'm around. Morning. Hello. Ryan. Okay. Um, so I don't know who else. Oh, we got the neuron background now. Serious. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how's everyone doing? Uh, good. That's very good. And we've had, uh, we kind of got back into meetings this week. <clears throat> we got, I visited Jesse and Avery in Chicago um, two week, two Sundays ago now, almost two Sundays ago. And it was pretty good. We had a lot of uh, productive, we had a productive session, uh, a lot of discussions about things, planning out things for the future or things we might want to pursue um, in the coming months. So, I, you know, I thought that was really good and we need to follow up on that, but uh, that's good. Oh, hello, Morgan. Then I've been meeting with a lot of you one-on-one -on -one or in, in different meetings this week. So I met with Brian, I met with uh, the uh, GSOC group, and I met with the uh, Cogn Cognition Futures group. And I met with Rashik, who's not here, but he's interested in doing some work with reinforcement learning and some intelligence augmentation stuff. And so uh, well, I'll follow up on that as well. So it's all good. Um, do we want to do updates? Uh, who wants to start? Okay, he's just getting coffee. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could give an update. Um, okay. I already have a couple of them. Um, let's see. Uh, where I'm at right now is mostly working on the GSOC project and trying to really just imagine what a useful uh, landscape or um, uh, the, what the dimensionality and what the parameters of a model for an open source development community viewed as collective cognition would be. I'm just, I'm still there. So if anyone has any thoughts about that, I'm, that's, that's all that I'm thinking about. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's great. Uh, we had a discussion, yeah, a couple times this week about that. Um, so, and it's interesting because we're kind of doing that in practice here. So it's like it carries over into <laughs> well, how you measure it, how you think about it more theoretically. Um, I mean, I have some thoughts, but I'm going to maybe bring them up a little later. All right. <laughs> Hello, Samantha. Uh, who else wants to give an update? I can give an update if you, if you want. Okay. Um, so I know I haven't been in a while. I did like a month of vacations and work and all of that. But um, this week, um, research-wise, I've started putting, looking at different sites. I know I helped Jesse a couple weeks ago with the um, virtual reality and um, sign language and that. And I looked a little bit more into that because I got rereading all my old stuff and it put a different perspective in my head and I enjoyed looking at that. Um, and for the other research with the empathy and artificial intelligence, I've been a little stuck on putting more thoughts together, but I think that's just me getting back into the swing of things after the whole crazy month, but that's a little bit of what I've been up to. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you, your, uh, your summer is going well and, uh, <laughs> So that's great. And uh, yeah, that was a nice uh, presentation Jesse gave on VR, and thank you for helping with that. And uh, yeah, I, I know we're trying to do some stuff with VR in the group, um, but you know, it's like one of those things where you not only have to 
be able to want to do it, but you have to have maybe some equipment to do it as well. Sometimes you don't, but it, it really depends on the question. So, yeah. yeah. I haven't had the pleasure of looking at VR, like like an actual like set yet, but yeah. hoping one day, because it'll be cool to test theories, like you said. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Amanda. <laughs> yeah. Um, what have I been doing? The Cognition Futures Reading Group. Um, so we finished the book we were working on, and we're going to pick a book at the next meeting, I believe, um, or just over Slack. Um, and what else? I've been working through Steve Brunton's data science textbook, because um, it seems to start from the ground floor, which is what I need, and it comes with very useful YouTube videos. Um, so that's one thing I've been working through on my own. Um, that's about it for this past week. That's good. Yeah, we we had our we finished up the book we're reading in Cognition Futures, and we we need to we we've yet to decide on an, another or what we're going to do next. So it could be a book, it could be like some articles. I don't know. Who? Well, we had some discussion in the Slack about. Um, well, Brian's reading a book. Um, I can't remember which one it is. But he had a lot of stuff to say, and I was reading through it, but I can't remember what it says now. So, so yeah, there, yeah. Amanda asked me if Lobus had any Lobus. correlations with um, the depressed we were reading, and and there are a lot of them. And in fact, Varela, uh, Francisco Varela, was involved in Lobus's manuscript, The Postmodern Brain. Um, so there's a, and and in, all over Embodied Mind, they're always like, oh yeah, Globus is a good example of this. And you're always like, of what though? And then, so yeah, I wrote some some thoughts in the Cognition Futures channel about uh, trying to kind of summarize what Globus is saying because um, he kind of just goes off in all sorts of directions, which is really fun to read, but then kind of difficult when you try to summarize it later. You're like, well, he said, oh, what did he say? You know. So, <laughs> but I I'm gonna... out loud. Yeah, yeah exactly. Out his... <laughs> he doesn't really say anything. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's great. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, I, I look forward to seeing uh, more meet. You know what we might do in the future meetings, and uh, if people are interested in joining us, uh, we meet usually Wednesday nights at nine p.m. Eastern. Um, so that could be I don't know uh, uh, six p.m. Pacific. And, you know, it's probably pretty too late for people in Europe or India to join in or anywhere else, but uh, North America to work out for you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that was a pretty good book that we reviewed. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of stuff there that needs to be pulled together because there are a lot of loose ends that we left. Um, we have a notes document, which is uh, in our drive in our shared drive and so we'll probably go over that um at the next meeting and kind of maybe tie up some of those loose ends so one thing i found interesting or useful from some of this sort of some of these interactions where we generate an notes document we have meetings and we have like this really good conversation and jesse has been involved in this quite a bit is kind of keeping these ideas together and pursuing them forward so uh Jesse has this idea of the whirly gig method or something like that, where the whirly gigs are, I think they're like uh, uh, maple seeds or something that fall in the fall in North America. Yeah, they twirl down. And so the idea is that, oh, you want to explain it, Jesse? Um, well, I mean, um, the windmills are just an analogy um, yeah. where like, these things are falling. And if, you, if you're if you've been around those trees where they just they kind of you know in in I don't know if it's like autumn or what season but they, they just start falling and they keep in the air and sometimes it just they're very 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 slow to fall um, but it's like you have to catch them before they hit the ground and it's like it's just an analogy for like right now. It's like with half of this book, and there's these little birds, little twirly bird, seedling things falling, falling very slowly in the air. 
And it's just like, you kind of have to deal with them while they're still in the air, as opposed to letting them fall to the ground and then activating them again. So it's kind of a just like a way of thinking about like, okay, like what do we do? Because we have all this stuff activated right now and it's like slowly losing, um, you know, it's kinetic energy. It's, it's like changing and dissipating over time because it eventually will just go to a resting state. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's kind of like, what do we do with it? Can we make this into a blog post? Can we turn some discussion? Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to put it. it the way you put it about uh, kinetic energy cap captured before dissipation. And it's, uh, you know, the idea that we have all these ideas that are kind of going by and we'll lose them if we don't put them down somewhere or, or try to do something actionable with them. So we try to capture them and, you know, make them into something that's not like another note <laughs> that gets ignored. So, you know, this is a good opportunity to sort of look at that and say, you know, what are the sort of action items or what are the things that we can build out from here or follow up on? And... I think, you know, I'll go through the document. I think there's a lot of stuff there that's like, t have, has ties to other things that we're doing in the lab. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, it may not all just be like cognition futures related. It might, there might be some other tie-ins. So, th but that's, that's good that we kind of stop and think about that. And that's why we do these uh, notes documents and kind of make sure that we can, you know, capture some of this energy. <laughs> So uh, thank you for the update, Amanda. Um, Jesse or Morgan, do you are you ready to give an update? There's there's a few things I'll say, but I need like two more minutes before I can say them fully. So if you want to say anything, Morgan, go ahead. I know Morgan also said he was moving or something. Oh yeah, so he had to move. I think to a different location. We're probably in the same situation. <laughs> Well, yeah, so I think the, uh, you know, we're kind of heading into the Neuromatch season. So this coming Monday is the start of Neuromatch. And this is going to be about three weeks where we have, uh, I don't know, I think Brian's in the computational neuroscience course. I'm learning, I'm doing the deep learning. Deep learning course, okay. All right. Uh, and I don't know if anyone's doing the computational neuroscience course, um, but it's, so you can do the three-week course, and that's what they call the fire hose method of uh, inquiry. And I don't know if we've talked about that before, but this is where you get three weeks and you get all, like, sort of the entire field of computational neuroscience or a lot of deep learning thrown at you. And you have to kind of figure out how to make sense of it. <laughs> and really, it's I don't really think it's supposed to be making sense of it. What they do is they try to give you like a bunch of lectures you just have to be immersed in it you have to like just take out as much as you can and then you have a project and the project of course helps you synthesize it in some way and so um, i'm going to be leading a project or i'm going to be um, mentoring a project uh, i'm not sure what the topic is yet because they usually pick it out like during the first week so um that's and then you know we'll be i think you know, maybe for over the next three weeks, we'll talk a little bit more about Neuromatch. Maybe we'll have some discussions about what was learned that week. And um, so I hope to integrate it a little bit more into the curriculum. Um, now, if you're interested in the non-Firehose version of Neuromatch, and that's useful <laughs> because you get that, you know, that uh, just that everything dumped on you at once. But you can also do what they call a slow pod. And this is where they have the materials for the Neuromatch courses online. The reason you might want to take it uh, is to get credit for it, you know, and it's a, you get a certificate and all that. But if you really want to understand the material, you can unpack it over a longer period of time, maybe like uh, two months, three months or whatever. Maybe something like a reading group uh, where you go over each lesson and you kind of like think about what it is, make sure you're thinking about like the you know how they fit together and uh you know this is a longer period of time uh it's slower but you get more out of it maybe and you get to synthesize things in place so actually daniela 
expressed interest. I don't know if people know who Danielle Cialfi is, but she's been in the Slack, and you'll you'll see her around. Uh, she's expressed interest in doing a slow pod. Uh, we haven't really gotten there yet, but it that might be something we'll be doing um, maybe later on the summer. We'll see. So I I yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the best thing is this, is to express interest in it <laughs> if people are interested in doing it and then we can go from there because I think just doing it okay <laughs> just doing it like as a, a solitary thing and then saying well we'll set everything up that's maybe not the way to go on that but so my neuromatch update is I may not be able to do the full course this summer um in part because there's one of the tutorial sessions I think I'll basically just never really be able to go to. And I could probably talk to them and say, hey, this day I just can't do this because I, I'm like, I, I'm always double booked and sometimes I'm quadruple booked on that day at that time. And it's just like, there's not gonna be, there's 0% chance I'll be showing up here unless it's some holiday, <laughs> uh, which isn't going to happen. So um, I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm currently in flux about it. I need to email my, my, my pod leader and say, look, you know, how's this going to work? But like, I, I don't, I'm honestly leaning towards not directly participating in the deep learning, but I might do a slow pod around it. I don't, I don't quite know what, I'm not sure what that's going to be right now. Um, which is a little bit disappointing, but also like, I have a lot going on this summer in general, and there's some other coursework that I'm attempting to do. And, you know, a deep learning intensive thing would be good for me, but it's also not necessarily like, it is not the highest priority thing going on for me. So I'm not quite sure. I'm not, I'm not. I don't want to, I'm not seeing, trying to seem dismissive or, or, or anything of the, of the course. It's more looking at the schedule directly and comparing it with my current obligations was like, mm, because it would be one thing if it was like in the project time thing, like if the project or the, like the, the other thing, but that it's in the tutorial, like tutorials, for those who don't know Neuromash, tutorials are like a big you you are expected to go to the tutorials like out of all the things that's kind of the most important thing and like there's like attendance at the tutorials at least there was in the past and people are flexible and, you know people are understanding but um just the fact that i would always miss one of the days at, at least um gives me a little bit of pause so um but that said um I love Neuromatch and support support them however I can. Um, I'm honestly like to the point where if I, I like I wouldn't want I wouldn't even ask to refund my my tuition because I'd rather just donate it to them honestly. And in part, and I say that not because I'm super generous, but also because like I in the past have received a lot from them for like much less than what I paid. This this tuition was more. They kind of giving you a hard limit of like two hundred dollars or whatever this year. In the past, it was much, much, much less or nothing. And I I, I paid nothing in the past, and I can you know. So it's more of a cumulative thing, rather than oh, I'm just you know throwing two hundred dollars at you know something because just, just, you know just to say it that way. Um, I I feel like I've gotten over the last three years, I've gotten a lot from them, so I don't I don't mind that. So anyway, that's my neuromatch commentary. Yeah. Um, I have other updates too, and I can talk okay. about. But I don't know if you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um. Yes, I don't know the best way. I mean, there was a cool picture. If you didn't see it, there was a nice picture of Bradley, Avery, and I in in the, in the email, and there were some others. I still need to send them to Bradley. Um, it was great to meet uh, everybody in person again. First time I met Bradley, um, we, and I'm also like, you know, I think everybody knows Bradley's a fairly cool person, but in, in meeting them and in, in meeting him directly was, um, was nice. 
the first thing we did is just like walk to the Bean, like the, the Millennium Park, and see that, that big silver thing in Chicago. Um, and it was just nice, a nice like walk and talk. And then we we spoke for like hours with Avery um, there um, about a number of things, which is really good. I took a bunch of notes on it. Um, let me see. I'm not going to even try to go over everything right now. Um, but but uh, there was a lot of good talk about like him studying information and 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 a really interesting discussion about sampling rate and how I know Bradley's working on a sampling rate paper and just a lot of things in the context of um, like at, at some point as a, as a general note to the as a general note to like the lab I don't know if I'll be, I could get Jenny to, to do it, maybe, and potentially Avery. And Avery has expressed interest in coming to the meetings, even though it's only like a limited capacity. Um, also, by the way, um, they have health limitations uh, as to why they maybe won't be here all the time. But they can explain that. Um, Uh, but but I feel like there's, I I think I should make a presentation at some point just to bring everybody up to speed about what's happening in plot twisters, because plot twisters is not directly, is not a part of the, of our lab, but it's something that Avery and I and Jenny who's sort of not really a part of the lab but like definitely external collaborator role, and someone who's. Jenny's long-term goals. Um, Jenny's long-term goals are um, significantly related to some of the things that I want to do. Um, and plot twists is kind of a um, a cool, zany, let's say, uh, right-brained attempt at, at creating something. Um, but that's also quite related to a lot of the internal work that maybe Cognition Futures is looking at, but from a very from a super different perspective. Um, but but it's it's also it's, it's, I don't know how much Jenny would want to get into this, uh, but what I will say is like, you know, you know how like um, this is <laughs> this is an awkward reference because it's like totally opposite. But you know how like Quentin Tarantino in his films. He's basically been training to keep making successive films of a specific way. Like all of those films are kind of the same. I kind of make fun of them sometimes. Like all your dude, all your movies are the same because uh, and like they're boring because like okay, like I know what's gonna happen, but like that, that that's totally unfair. Um, but like and I you know I respect Quentin, but like Quentin has been Quentin's been doing sort of like like the like like how Tesla started out with the highest the highest the highest most expensive car and then refining and whittling down their experience to make something more and more and more accessible. So like this is Jenny Jenny's this this is the first iteration of of a long term project. Um, but that process fits very well with a lot of a lot of the the things that I'm looking at personally. And I think Bradley would be very interested too. So that that's something that I will vaguely reference in terms of Plot choices is more. Plot choices. What when I when I reference plot choices, I just I don't just mean what do you see on plotchoices.org where there's this like board game looking thing. Also, that we finally we as in, as in plot choices finally made a um, a map. Like we drew out a visual map of the game, the quote unquote game world. So it's actually something that like is concrete now, which is kind of amazing. But just like there, there's a little bit more at play than than what you see um, superficially, I suppose. And and I think there I think there's a need to to, to talk about that because right now I'm just like oh yeah blah blah blah, blah plot twitchers and on the side and it's like nobody knows what that means. So I feel like it's time to to, to do that. And I think I'll, I'll bring it up with 
with Avery and Jenny. And this kid's like, hey, like I'm mentioning Plot Twist here. Could we, I don't know if they, if they want to specifically do something or I could just put something in more formally. Okay, so that's that's a whole like aside. Um, and just, just to make it clear, like Plot Twisters isn't, um, and I say this kind of for like Sam and the other folks who are interested in, in empathy, Plot Twisters is not directly um, like how do we make a machine be empathic? But Plot Twisters absolutely has overlap with how do does an agent look at their internal configurations in the context of their environment and sort of develop the uh, what are the means by which empathy and self and other perception um, takes place. So it's not necessarily directly related to it in the technical sense, but there is, um, it's extreme. If people, because I know Sadna, who isn't here right now, and I know Sam's here, and I know a couple of other people express interest in this empathy um, AI stuff. And I feel like there's a tremendous amount of room for kind of like a, a hybrid plot twisters, cohesion features, whatever. I mean, even philosophy, if you want to go there, because it kind of related. But like, there's there's enough of an overlap. Like, there could be a project just centered around how do we look at empathy, both like, um, I think about it in terms of like, from an agent-based perspective of like, okay, here's here's um, maybe a human agent and and maybe here's a, an artificial agent and what kind of parallel, like what, what are existing, you know, not parallels, but like overlaps, like what, what, what can, I think it'd be great to even start with what can an agent right now start with. And there's a lot of things that do, you know, this goes into effective computing and facial recognition and emotion detection. Like there's a lot of movement in that area. Um, but there's also like a lot of competing ways to 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 um, categorize emotion, to categorize internal states and a lot of cultural stuff. And you get a lot of nuance the more deeper you get into that. And it's like, okay, uh, I, I kind of feel like I, it, it's, this harkens a bit to developmental robotics as a means to test a lot of things and like embody cognition. I, I think I think the the AI empathy is sort of an interesting way to look at what can we basically computationalize right now in terms of our understanding of the process of empathy. And I kind of think seeing I think seeing the AI stuff bit as a bit of a methodological medium, or it's like okay in this medium. What 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 are we okay with like computing or uh, applying, you know, some kind of uh, digitalization or mathematical whatever to it? So that's basically what it would be. And like, what what is really hard to do in that context? And I think that would be a really great place to start. So maybe we'll come to the back to that later. Um, but that's kind of an extremely large but probably important tangent that goes from plot twisters to empathy and back again and all this other stuff. That said, um, the meeting, going back to the meeting in person in Chicago, um, it was very good. I'm really, I'm really thankful it happened. I know Amanda was kind of almost wanted to go. I know Hussein, I know a few other people were like, oh, if I, I, I want to go, or they, they almost could go, but then something came up. So I appreciate all the people who wanted to go. Um, originally, it was going to be a, a potentially larger meeting, uh, but like even even Jenny, uh, yeah. uh, Jenny had to um, Jenny's flight got essentially delayed. Like she had she had a much longer layover than than she originally anticipated. Um, that said, um, it was still great. Took a bunch of notes, and even even things like We Robot. Um, I may briefly talk about that later today. Uh, I don't have a full thing to show right now, but it mostly just be words and very simple images anyway. There's been a lot of progress on, on I feel really good about the We Robot stuff right now and the two posters we have to do for that. Thanks in part for the meeting and what I've been thinking about since then. 
Um, outside of that, uh, everybody kind of already talked about condition futures, so I won't I won't do that again. I'll just I'll just say like the reading group's been awesome. Um, I actually I hosted it from alongside the river last night last time. That was a lot of fun. That was that was like the most normal I felt in probably five weeks. Uh, so it was a long, a long time for me to feel like, oh, like this is this is something fun and nice. Def- I'm, I totally agree with what Bradley said and and others about like, if if nobody's read the book on becoming aware by Depraz and Varela and, and and a third person, I forget. Um, it's, I think it's basically the last or one of Varela's last works, right? Amanda, is that what he said? Was it the final one? Um, I'm, um, I'm not sure. I know it was published in 2003, which was after Varela died. Yeah, it was the posthumous um, thing. So, uh, like, it's really cool to kind of see what he was aiming at over the trajectory of his career and, like, where it was going at the end. Um, and to that end, like, what they were talking like really trying to push this this practice forward. And the book was was sort of like this mix between practice, this heavy emphasis on practice, like how to. Like it was it was almost it was almost as much like a manual for how to do both like this this sort of becoming aware and how to help or observe becoming aware and, and like trying to give some <laughs> some methodology to it. Um, and I do think some of the things in the article were like, like the, the, we read an article before and it kind of critiqued the book and, and critiqued Verla's efforts or whatever about where things were. And like, I agree that like, yes, there could be a lot more to be done and, and using using something like film uh, would be interesting as, as, a, as a methodologically enhanced uh, thing to do. But I'm so glad to read the book because I feel like, um, on a personal level, like I feel like it felt really candid. I think I think is what I feel about it now, and what I mean by candid is like it felt like it's is is it the most polished finished work? No, but it felt like a, a quality insight. It's a great. I mean, it's very articulate, but it felt like a real insight and very well worded take on here's what we're trying hard to flesh out and we know this is a work in progress at best but we're going to try to use the best language we can to describe where we're at and how we're doing it and why and that to me feels like that just felt actually candid and a bit inspiring at the end of the day because it's like i feel like that's so much of what i'm trying to do too and particularly in this weird recursive like what's the line you know how how do you even keep how do we talk about it all the time but how do you actually talk about an agent in an environment and the relations between it like how do you really do that and in with like language that's intelligible and and philosophically has some backing and like they were they 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 they, they trace some trajectories like all the way up through uh like buddhism and herschel and like a little bit of teasing about uh, I, I can't say his name. Merlot Ponty. What was the guy's name? The MP guy, the guy who kind of like brought things together. Um, like they, 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 they tried very well to do that. Um, and I just feel like it was is great. And so much of the language that I'm that I want to use in the future, I'm going to be referencing that book. And you know, I I saw in the chat that I think. Um, in the in the discussion in the slide, I saw a reference for um, uh, radical embodied condition from Shamero, um, and some other commentary on different books. Um, I know. Oh, I thought there was a comment from Amanda about something else too that I might have missed. Um, did you have a comment on the Bateson book, Amanda, or? No. Oh yeah, it looks super weird <laughs> structurally. Um, like the first section, the metalogs section, is just like a very strange way of 
I, I'm not exactly sure what he's trying to do. Um, and then like parts of the book look like it would be, uh, look like they would be relevant to us, but maybe not the whole book. But if other people haven't taken a look, then I, I don't want to make the decision for us. Oh yeah, yeah, that's something to come across later. Um, but no, thanks, <coughs> thanks everyone for the commentary. I actually wouldn't mind reading it in particle body condition again. It's cooking of science by Shamero. Um, but I know that we've read that before and in, in like I know Amanda's read that. So maybe maybe something like adjacent to that. Like there's some newer Shamero books too that might be interesting to look at. Um, but I'm told I'm 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 honestly have probably have a decent bias to looking at some of Shamero like Shamero's newer work or like his work in general, because I think I mean, I, I'm gonna, there's a very small chance, but I think that I would get in, but I think I might try to apply to a PhD with him. So like, I am interested in his stuff. Um, we'll see. Um, I don't, I don't, don't hold me to that. I might change my mind, but it's on the radar. Um, that said, for as far as other updates or anything else, a lot of cool stuff to sort out current features. I'm super glad we did Varela's The Unbecoming Aware book. Um, there's a tremendous amount of stuff evolving in plot twisters, which is great. Um, and I have, you know, micro updates for the Wii Robot stuff. Um, Frontier Map stuff is going forward, but nothing really fun to show right now. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, uh, let's, uh, let's pick a time in the near future, Amanda, to actually sit down and talk about our, our philosophy stuff, because, um, I think it's time for that. And I think I'm finally like, <laughs> I almost want to say sober enough to have the conversation. I have not been, you know, intoxicated, but it feel it feels like I've just been so out of it for so long. And I think I think, oh, like I have a few days of normalcy now and like I can do it. Um, my life has been a tremendous uh I've been sick, I've been traveling, I've been and then there's, there's been emergencies and drama before and after. So um yeah, um there's 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 stuff to happen there and even in the sense of like um, I know everybody's kind of in the midst of their summer stuff, but I think putting out a little bit of a, a little bit of a call for involvement, like as a, as a philosophy intern or, or into the, into the fall, like, I think there's some, I think we're, we're at a kind of a right point for that. So I want to, I want to make sure we hit that time period correctly. Um, but yeah, uh, we can, we can sort out a time. I'm free a lot of this weekend and into the next couple of days. So um, we can sort out our time in Slack though or whatever, but that that's still on the radar as well. Um, that's, I think that's all of my updates. There was a lot there. Um, oh, last thing I'll say, um, and, and I kind of will defer to Bradley about how much to say this. We talked a little bit at, in Chicago um, about, See what did I write here? Um, like the future of of the lab and what we want to be doing in in like over the next year or two years, like just long term broad view. We could have had a you know like a big outlook discussion, and I think that was I think that was um, a nice thing to talk about. And I don't know if you wanted to say more about that. In, in general during this meeting, or if you want me to just wrap on it for like the 20 seconds that I have of thoughts over what we said. Yeah. Uh, you can uh, like give your thoughts first and then I'll give my thoughts more. Oh yeah, um, and I, I, I only, I took like, just like a couple like bullet points about it. Um, uh, Cause I mean, we talked, we talked a lot about like my projects and, and some Avery thoughts and I'm like, well, I want to have a little bit of time at the end just to think about like, you know, the future of the lab, what we want to do and nothing, nothing like major, no like revolutionary stuff 
Um, but I think, I think, um, I think two things that I put down particularly were, um, you know, there was a little bit of a further discussion about how, how, how do we relate to and talk about like our, the relationship between orthogonal lab and, and diva worm. The, that that kind of came up a little bit in terms of like certain projects that we're talking about and the best way to use the resources in the two groups to some extent, because there's there's a like, I think people kind of get this, but like diva worm is kind of like more biology based. Like it's it it it's basically a you know open worm foundation is is the main host for that group, and then Bradley kind of runs a specific diva worm group. That's about developmental approaches to to you know deworms kind of about simulating the elgins and, and so on and devo worm is a bit more like developmentally approach to that and a lot of other things and there's devo learn and, and, and its own github and also has its own google summer code people and but it's like there's a lot of you know just just thinking about the best way to do stuff with that um like that came up i think that's an important thing to think about but I think the most, like the biggest takeaway that I I wrote down and remember, um, is is returning to maybe a bit more focus on developmental AI, um, because that's that's something that we kind of thought a lot about like maybe a year or so ago. Um, I kind of I, I kind of blew up a lot of things with the the. Cognition Futures and also the Society Ethics and Technology team were like, um, I don't know. I, I I feel like I kind of inserted those uh, specifically, and I don't I don't mind that. I don't think it was a terrible thing, but I think I think there's a lot of <laughs> how do I say this? There's a lot of inertia and momentum in the lab. But it's almost like undercurrent and not obvious or not really clear to those who haven't been here since I think pretty much most of the folks, with exception to maybe Morgan who might have been around, like weren't directly around during the time when we started talking about developmental AI and where we wanted to go and what we wanted to do with that because it was a bit Developmental AI, in one sense, is a um, it's a banner, not quite a major banner, but like if you if you remember that that diagram that I drew, which I can't pull up right now, you know there was like these major banners of like cognition futures and uh, meta brains and the educational component to things and um, stuff like that. There were like five large banners. And there were a bunch of external groups we worked with, and there were a bunch of topics and projects that we in the middle of that that sort of orthogonal lab diagram. And de de developmental AI or dev AI is it, it's not really a major banner yet, but it kind of could be. It could also it could kind of be a, a, a it could in one sense ultimately like maybe supersede meta brains, but it's not really there yet. And it, it's sort of this. At one point, brothers, like we could, we should establish this as 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 a field and the space to kind of recognize what we're doing here, um, and I think that's still actually quite relevant because there's still a lot of overlap between like neuro AI and biologically inspired AI, but I, you know, it's sort of a, it's definitely a space. Uh, it's like a attractive land that that could be sort of like claimed and built up more. Um, and I think I think a lot of things, even even some of even including a lot of the virtual reality stuff that we've talked about, um, still point the lab in that direction to the future. So I'll leave it at that. And I said a little more than I planned, but you can follow up on that probably. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's great. You know, I know Jesse came up with this banner system and groups and, and projects. So, you know, this is a thing that we need to, <laughs> we're always trying to reevaluate where things fit. Is it a banner which includes a bunch of different projects 
is it a group like Devil Worm, which is a sort of a group, you know, kind of a separate group of people. I mean, there's overlap, but, and then there's uh, the projects themselves, which people work on. So I agree that uh, developmental AI, we should return to that. I don't know if we've really turned away from it so much as not really focused on it uh, in terms of like a project. Like, you know, what are we pursuing right now? That's something that's like kind of <laughs> lagged because people haven't, you know, in part, the structure of the lab here actually uh, is based on what people are doing right now. So if people have certain interests and they're working on things, those get advanced. Other things don't get advanced as much. And then, you know, that's that's kind of the way the, the front, you know, the front line of the lab works. But mm. I do agree that we should make like, maybe a more conscious effort to return to some of these issues because they kind of, you know, we, it's not that we can't spend the time on them. It's that we're spending the time on other things, and which are good, but you know, uh, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, carving out a piece of attention for, like, something that you really want to do. So, you're going to say something, right. Jesse? Well, it's yeah. Just just to just to re, I, I kind of said this, and you 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 like followed up on it, and I want to like once again try to emphasize it for for a lot of the folks who are like looking here today or like like who are, haven't been following the story for like the last two years um it's it's absolutely not that dev ai hasn't been centered we, it, we, it's not just like forgotten it's just we haven't used that for lack of a better term theme or banner or or lens to talk about things so it's like could 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 a lot of what we're doing already fit I mean, it is like to me. It's very obvious. Like, yeah, this totally fits under the under that 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 stuff. But, but I think the thing about developmental AI is like, it's it's almost like there's an element to it that would be sort of like making a new field or making a new set of references. And it's like to use to, part of developmental AI stuff. I think, and, and this is initially the case was my thought, and, and not not just like what Bradley thinks, for example. If 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 we're doing developmental AI stuff to I won't say the fullest, but like part of developmental AI, it would be attempting to create some newer ways of talking about or relating stuff. Not not like generating a whole new field, but like 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 creating a I don't even want to say like an, an overlapping theory. Like there's a certain amount of there's a certain field building, not really field finding, but like field building work involved with it, because it's it's not developmental AI is 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 not like sometimes it's easiest to talk about it by differentiating from what it's not. Like it's not it's not just pure you know neuro AI. And, and there's definitely like biologically inspired like the Bika, Bika stuff. But but there's there's work to be done in terms of building, like we made a roadmap about what towards developmental AI that has a bunch of different projects that we'll be doing or developing at the time. And it's like, what would it what would it look like if we made progress in all those projects and then talked about it as a coherent unit, you know? So that's always been we have made progress on some of those things. Like there's been work on Gibsonian information consistently over the last couple of years. We just maybe haven't used the framework of, oh, well, in developmental AI context, we were doing this. So, I mean, like, I guess I'm just trying to say the work is still being done. It's just, that's what I'm trying to mean by like the, under, the undercurrent, like it's not, it's not like, like you've heard Cognition of Futures say like, Three three thousand percent more time more than <laughs> you know developmental AI, but like it's not it's not you know it's still alive you know it's it's not this 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 dead and buried thing that we that's from the past or like it it's just not we don't talk about it it doesn't it, in one sense it has terrible PR right now even though it's still happening um, what, what has so terrible I don't know PR what's really, <laughs> that what has terrible PR uh the dev ai right now oh like it just it's just not talked about oh okay yeah. in the lab yeah <laughs> like i'm just that's a bit of a joke but yeah. like you know like okay. it, it's not it, it's not well represented in what, how we talk about things 
but it's still happening. So I mean, to that end, I guess that then what functionally, what does this mean? Like in the future, we may have some, I think I even wrote a little bit of job descriptions or like, like intern descriptions about, about them in the past. But I think, I think in the next, and this maybe isn't even happening in, for like several months, but like over the course of the turn of the year, there may be a little bit of a shift towards openly saying, hey, we're going to work. We need a developmental AI focus. We're going to do this in the context of, of developmental AI. So I don't know. That's, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, th I agree. Like in terms of like the number of mentions that we have in the group, like it's pretty low but it's also one of those things it's like a banner right it's like the banners are not as visible as the different projects or right. you know different things like that so it's people aren't going to be drawn to it i mean i guess you know one way to solve that is to have people specifically interested in that sort of synthesis and like if right. you're interested in development you're interested in ai because i know there are a lot of people all uh, like neuromatch associated people or even like you know academy and conference or even people out in the world of ai who are interested in these developmental approaches but um you know there uh there there are a number of groups doing this but it's like you know um you to build your own perspective is i think you know there's enough room in that area that you can build your own perspective and there's no real unifying language for it which is the most important thing which is that you don't have terms of art that are really kind of get at some of the issues as to like why development is important so why do we care about a developmental approach to ai uh well i mean right. there, there are aspects of like you know allowing the machine or the algorithm to bootstrap itself or drawing inspiration from like plasticity or other things and we have a lot of different things that we've done in the you know past two or three years but even in the past year that kind of hit on those topics but we don't call it developmental ai yes absolutely. so yeah so i think the the key is is that especially with some of these banners that we have some intellectual integration around it like you right. know and that that involves like you know maybe defining key terms uh you know coming up with some uh models perspective models that we might use to test these ideas so like we have the uh Brainberg vehicles which is a type of agent that we can use for that but we have other agents as well uh i i don't know what you know uh which but we need to do a more rigorous evaluation of that like so what agents are best for something like this what agents are maybe not so good for something like this what are the mechanisms maybe like a computational mechanism by which you can demonstrate development in AI. So, you know, if I wanted to say we're going to demonstrate how vision is sort of bootstrapped from development, um, you know, maybe we have like a model of a retina or we have like a very simple agent. And then we say in, in this one of the papers that we have, it's an archive paper right now, but we kind of lay out some of this where, you know, there's a timeline uh it, it kind of shows like development and it kind of shows mm -hmm. how that can be used to sort of do this bootstrapping. So there's like, for example, a critical period where things are acquired. There's other, there are other things like, um, you know, like a morphogenetic stage. And then there's like a learning stage, uh, beyond the critical period. And, you know, defining those more is good. Um, yeah, so I mean that's and then there are other things we need to deal with like uh, thinking about like what is it that uh, developmental AI kind of uh, gives you an advantage over other approaches. So you know one one thing that the linguists talk about is compositionality. So you know compositionality is where you take as a baby maybe you're trying to learn language, you uh, learn some words, you learn some phonemes, you put things together. And they call it compositionality. So you're composing different rules, different pieces of language, and then you know you're putting things together. And there's this uh, creative aspect where you can like modify words and things like that. And you know once you start getting on that path towards adulthood, you know your use of language changes, and it's largely learning about that. And I know Morgan 
uh, probably can, you know, uh, talk about that quite a bit. But I mean, getting that, like saying, what is the advantage of, say, like developmental AI over something like compositionality? You know, you could uh, say it's mere compositionality when you see people striving for like language compositionality, say in large language models. We could offer something more than that for other modalities other than language, you know, uh, like attention or learning or, you know, more general learning or other things. So those are the sort of the goals in that uh, area. And I know we have that roadmap that I showed Jesse at oh, when we met in Chicago, but we need to also do, I think, a little bit more maybe brainstorming as to what that, maybe what some of the concrete aspects of that roadmap look like. Yeah, and, and I think there's some stuff then like, I think just to wrap, just to say a bit more about that, um, and I actually, uh, yeah, um, I I really want to go back to this. I don't have a means to like record or take notes. So I'm just gonna have to go back to the recording, or if Bradley's taking notes there. Um, I think administratively, the way forward on this is gonna be one. We need to clear like I imagine a lot of people here when they hear developmental AI, they're like, "Sounds cool." What the heck is it like? Like, like really, like really, what is it? So I think I think having a accessible, simple maybe maybe it's its own like project website or something, but it needs to have a visible face, like a paragraph or two to say what it is specifically, because um, it it needs to have just just like cognition features or other things that I'm dealing with, and also like. In, in a little bit of a sense, I, I, I'm realizing I might want to use developmental AI as a kind of, I might want to use it as learning experience for how to, to flesh out such a thing, because I'm going to want to be doing that later in my life, I think, for some other stuff. Um, but like, you know, it's going to need something it's going to need its own like like marketing material for lack of better words it's going to need something people can look at and say okay here's a couple paragraphs here's here, here's here's some key diagrams or map or roadmap you know and then maybe put put a set of papers that like here are papers that we've been working on that fall into this category and then at a very high level um in in the middle of more of a selective way, like recruiting people to, to help flesh out the uh, field building efforts will be something, but in a more accessible general way, getting some specific, getting in, getting interns or getting people who want to focus like, okay, like, yeah, like I want to focus on, you know, like some of the examples that Bradley said about like vision. Like how do we incorporate developmental vision, critical periods, and vision in, in terms of like machine learning or AI, AI stuff? Like like getting some specific work within our we have, we have, we have to have work done in a specific context, and I think the responsibility is we have to demonstrate and, and clarify what the context is first and foremost, and then we can have lower not I don't mean lower level like less prestigious but like more boots on the ground efforts, I suppose, about developing and pushing some of those specific context within that context stuff forward. And then we need to have a little bit higher level. How are we advancing the, the developing field of the developmental AI? What are, I don't really know the words for that yet. Like all of those things need to happen. And Theory that's and a practice. lot of work. Yeah, exactly. What was that? Like theory and practice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we need to work on both. And also, like, the, for lack of better terms, and I think about this in part because I'm... Like, <laughs> I'm facilitating various elements of this both here and in jobs and the things that I do. Like, we need, for for the coherency of it all, 
there needs to be administrative effort and, and holding the context has to be held together through administrative, like, like, I don't mean, I don't mean like administrative assistant, you know, secretarial work, although it's partly yes, but just like there has to be like higher level organization about what's being, you know, put out uh, or, 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 or aimed at. And that's, that's hard. Yeah. That, that's very challenging work to do. Yeah. So. Yeah, it is. So I know that Morgan is, I, I said, we'll get to you next. And it's been a while. <laughs> hey there. Um, yeah, you know, it has been. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to be uh, catching up for a while. It's going to be slow over the summer. Yeah. But, uh, but there, there has been some uh, uh, some great great presentations recently that I just wanted to um, talk about and and point people to the to the Slack um, for um, uh, I mean certainly the the big meeting or um, videos have been dropping on YouTube from the International Conference of Mathematical Neuroscience. <clears throat> and, um, and uh, you know, so there's there's tons of tons of talks. I'd started dropping them in. I didn't didn't know about the meeting, but um, but Danny Bassett's uh, uh, kind of overview of network control theory is certainly, you know, is the, is the highlight. Um, <clears throat> and uh, They've got lots of they've got lots of references and and other things to um, to to follow up on from from that discussion um, or that review. <clears throat> so that that that's that's also nice because um, you know they're covering the kind of Steve Brunton material or you know giving you a, a, an overview, high level overview of that um, uh, you know with with the references. Um, as well as the kind of nonlinear time series analysis and yeah uh, other other points that uh, kind of get <clears throat> yeah because the uh, they're doing this this full high level overview um, yeah the, all that complexity is, is covered um, then uh, the um, I, so I'm not sure how you pronounce the name is Demi Hassabis. Um, uh, but, uh, he had the interview on Lex Friedman and that, that was really interesting just because I, I hadn't, I didn't know that he was a game designer. Um, uh, and so that, that makes a lot more sense or you know, certainly, uh, that, that was interesting to hear about just how central game design was to kind of the creation of deep mind. Um, that, that I thought was was interesting, as well as, of course, where where he ends it, which is the um, the work that he's doing together with the um, the head of the Turing Institute or one of the co-directors of the um, no, the Crick Institute. Sorry. So the Alan Turing Institute is right next door to the Francis Crick Institute. Um, uh, like the British Library is where the Alan Turing. Institute so they're all there in King's Cross because uh, apparently that's where DeepMind is too. Um, but uh, I, I, the really interesting, you know, so in this uh, really key paper, um, and give me my, my, I don't have my glasses and stuff, um, but core control principles of the eukaryotic cell cycle is this um, paper, yeah, you know, Bradley, I've seen this. Um, but you can, Get a better sense of of the kind of work that um, that DeepMind's doing with um, with people at the group, and and how how computational it is, you know how how very related to the kind of um, whole cell models that um, that are at least starting you know people are starting to work with and starting to think about how to, to solve these kind of massive, you know, 2000 equation systems or, or more. Um, and 
so that that was the uh, you can again find the, find those links in that um uh, brain organ it's uh channel and um uh, and then um so i don't know what the, the video uh i was going to drop the video apparently it's been blocked um due to it's using bbc footage so i just i just saw the the um uh, but anyway, this is the machine learning street talk, uh, which is a, a really great channel. That's that's had a lot of videos that haven't been blocked. <laughs> um, uh, but this one is is focused on. It was like three three hours or something. It, it only came out last night. Um, but uh, it's a compilation of their own previous interviews with people like Yan Lukun and others, but all related to uh, uh, an interview that they're doing with Noam Chomsky. And, and, and it's kind of fleshing out, you know, where these, these language, large language models, um, uh, where, yeah, what, what, what real work is going on with large language models. <laughs> and, and we're sort of getting to Bradley's point about, or, you know, the, the Previous point about compositionality and the the meeting that had um, I think this goes back to maybe like June thirtieth or something, but the Gary Marcus meeting on compositionality in AI. Um, the uh, I forget like sorry the second speaker that day, second speaker on the first day uh, uh, had all these great linguistic examples of uh, the large language models failures. Right. And, and just the really, yeah, uh, um, again, that, that was a great meeting in terms of, of hearing a bunch of linguists, you know, not deep learning people, but just a bunch of linguists, like, wait, what, what, yeah, now we've picked apart this, uh, uh, or we've got, gotten to play with this API for some time, and, um, and these are all the different failure modes that we've found. And that definitely it, it relates to this uh, 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 Noam Chomsky interview that uh, that they did, and and it's a really great team of pulling together, you know, it, it, like previous. I, I think what probably sunk them is that they pulled, you know, public uh, uh, video of Chomsky from like going back to the fifties oh. and forwards, and I think that's um, anyway that's that might be why they got a flag. YouTube right now, um, it, it, but it, it's a reminder that Yan LeCun had a paper that uh, uh, kind of a position paper that just came out, and um, if somebody can find the title, but it, it's it's uh, a lot of their interview, and if you haven't seen their videos previously, you know they'll they'll kind of spend time looking at the paper. And, yeah, and uh, uh, step, stepping you through the paper itself, and then mixing that with with um, you know Q and A with the with the author. Um, uh, so it's really nice presentation of of you know not only kind of Yan Lacun's vision of of where things should go, but also again like multiple people. Uh, some of the some of the kind of longtime guests, I, I think, of, of the, their channel, uh, essentially just hitting on these large language models, like what what are emergent properties from them, what are, um, uh, yeah, a, a, and and a, a big uh, focus, obviously, on, on where do they fall short, right, and and uh, and and additional directions. It, it, more than just compositionality, but definitely related to also the the, the developing uh, AI story, and um, uh, but but very much on the you know these large language models aren't even trying to capture what we're what we're doing with reasoning and things like that, um, and yeah, there's probably some other some other uh, references dropped in, but um, that would be my my update well that's wonderful yeah thank you uh i'm going over some of those things in the slack and 
uh, yeah, if you get a chance to look at some of the videos, because there's always there are always these events going on, you know that you get kind of overwhelmed. But it's we have a lot of people in the group, so <laughs> some people are going to be interested in some things and some people in others. I I, I know that the Mark Gary Marcus uh, session on compositionality is now on YouTube. They have a website um, and they released both. So they had two days. One was like where they did like compositionality from like Gary Marcus, of course, to the first lecture. And then they had, uh, you know, like some linguists and they had some machine learning people or deep learning people. And then the, the second day they had like a panel to discuss uh, what was learned. And I think that's, you know, it's a great, it's sort of like we've been talking about large language models for the past several weeks, these different papers that have come up. And I think it's a really interesting area just to kind of to talk about, like, you know, this is like one example of like a, a nice big model that's really doing, you know, it's performing like, I guess people think it's like a human or like a intelligent entity. And then, you know, what, what can we learn about that in terms of cognitive science, in terms of like uh, philosophy, in terms of, um, you know, computational modeling? Um, yeah, so I mean, you definitely go and check out some of these videos. Um, so I wonder if, if you had any thoughts. I know we talked, and I know you don't necessarily know the full scope of what we've been doing with developmental AI, but what are your thoughts, Morgan, on uh, what, what would be interesting in that area, or what, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, that, I mean... You know, I've, I've said before, like, I, I love that wood lab at, in Indiana. Yeah. Um, um, in terms of, you know, their their whole approach, right? Um, so it's, it's they're, they're using agents, they're using, you know, um, computer vision to, to grow things, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly the, you know the kind of the easiest or the easiest way in is just what uh, uh, the Al course is doing. The um, uh, sorry, it's like online. Uh, this is the the continual learning. Um, yeah, uh, um, I think it's sometimes called online learning. Um, yeah, it seems like sometimes the people who are working on the autonomous vehicle stuff have a slightly different vocabulary. Um, um, but yeah, the you know how, how are you updating a model without you know re retraining? Um, so you know how are you, how can you do incremental updates? Or or better still, you know, um, deal with the stream. A lot of those, a lot of those streaming techniques, um, and uh, wanted to say <clears throat> something on that. I don't know if I let me just see if I drop this into computational psychiatry. So, because <clears throat> we talked about Terry Lyons yesterday, um, and uh, uh, definitely has some some AI related work recently. No, it's the Wood Lab in, in Indiana, Indiana University. Um, uh, uh, they're called something like it's like um, it's like growing a mind dot github dot io or something like that. Like uh, 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 Terry Lyons. Um, uh, so he's got a paper. Uh, uh, I don't think I've dropped it in there. Um, uh, it looking at um, it's like a uh, he's doing a linguistic analysis, but he's basically it, it's the technique to deal with this kind of continuing stream of data that's it's um, it's related to rough path theory. But he's he's doing this to to identify uh, bipolar uh, and uh, some another diagnosis. Um, and I'll find the paper, but. Um, <clears throat> But again, like one of Yan Lecun's points in his position paper is is the um, again like speaking somewhat speaking to this developmental AI, although 
at least in John, or you know machine learning street talks uh, uh, position be like you know Yan Lacoon is definitely more in the empiricist camp um, um, but with the importance of self-supervised learning for for babies um, uh, you know that this is this is again one of the you're gonna have to find techniques that can kind of automatically uh, or I think the way that uh, Jan LeCun wants to put it is is passively learn, <clears throat> right? Is that is is um, I, I believe synonymous with self supervised, but um, uh, uh, again, to to, to self supervised, we, we we need kind of like more tricks to to, to pull out structure to to find the right. Uh, you know delineations in, in the stream in the oncoming stream so definitely like trying to utilize the flow uh to find those but um but yeah the, so terry line's got uh be interesting to look at this paper because I, I was trying to find our uh, i forget what we were um we, we were talking about a different optimization problem or something like that but in, in searching on his papers i found this uh, paper that he did with uh, with people in psychiatry. So uh, anyway, it was personally interesting, but I think it does relate again to this kind of passive learning, ethic, or you know, what people will need to be able to do to to improve passive learning. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 I'm sure it would be worth. You know, um, they they didn't uh, the the host of the machine learning street talk like didn't agree with Yan Lukun, but thought that his paper was was probably a good overview of the the different. You know, certainly it's it's uh, you know it, it, this uh, veteran researcher's position on the on the main main topic. Yeah. yeah. So going back to the thank you. Going back to the paper that I talked about on Archive, it was kind of a follow-up to our Bradenburg Vehicles paper. But we kind of laid out in there some things about continual learning and some things about like development in this stream. So, you know, there's this developmental sequence that uh, you can build that, you know, allows you to do this sort of continual acquisition or continual learning, and then you end up with an adult. And there's some terms that we introduced in there, although... I don't have the paper up, so I'm not going to go through it. But uh, just to say that uh, maybe next week I'll, I'll pull it up and we'll talk about it more, revisit it. Um, but it's, you know, it, it kind of lays some of these things out. I, I would like actually to maybe revise that paper and, and get a little bit more rigorous or, you know, um, kind of explore some of these ideas a little bit more and maybe come up with a glossary of terms. Because I think that people have been kind of hitting at this in different directions. I think there's a, like, on the one hand, people are seeing that there's a need for the sort of continual, you know, continuous learning as opposed to discrete learning. Uh, on the other hand, people are, they've always been sort of fascinated by development in terms of, you know, building something from nothing. So if you want to build an intelligent uh, thing, you can do, do it in maybe two ways. One is to program everything on board and hardwire it. The second way is to have it learn spontaneously from the environment. And then, of course, there's a third way, which is to say, I'm going to uh, train it, but I'm going to give it some things to start with, or what they like to call innateness, which is not like innateness you find in, well, I guess it is like an animal behavior. You have innateness where you have like um, innate behaviors. But, you know, there, there are a lot of creative ways you can think about doing that. Um, you know, giving, encoding different things that maybe have, uh, you know, different ways it can be manifest. So you might give it like a, uh, you might have like an artificial gene that expresses in a number of different ways. And, you know, it just basically, depending on the environmental context, it gives you some different thing, you know, discrete behaviors. Uh, but those behaviors are hard coded in the sense that they're, if you trigger them, they are there you know and then given those innates then you can learn things in the environment and those innates should help you learn things or put them together and so i mean that's the way i think people have approached it um with different differing 
versions of success. Um, you know, people have been, there's this holy grail, of course, of, uh, of uh, unsupervised learning, which is learning without supervision. No labels, no preordained knowledge, but that's very tough. And, you know, even when you can get really powerful models, you still have that fundamental problem that is, how do you put it together? <laughs> you know, you can put it together random. That doesn't help you do much. Uh, large language models, they can use, you know, uh, the rules of language. And in fact, if you use language instead of something like visual perception or even like something like uh, proprioception, it's a lot easier with vision or a lot easier with language because there's like a, a structure to it that we, I mean, there's a structure to vision too, but, um, you know, if you're going to use that, it's much easier to use language and its structure than I guess other modes of perception and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I, I guess, you know, <laughs> we should keep talking about this. I think it's very use, a uh, very good conversation to have. Yeah, just, just uh, yeah, again, related to that, um, uh, just a, a link to uh, towards geometric deep learning. Okay. Um, that uh, put in, I think, data ML. Um, again, how how best to how best to find structure, um, and um, and a lot of these, uh, or, and yeah how to encode these inductive biases that you're talking about. Yeah. I'm just taking the note here. Um, all right. Let me go to our chat. I know I haven't checked at all meetings, so there are 10 messages in here. I think they're mostly just things that we talked about. Uh, yeah. And this is the link to Jesse put in Building a Mind. That's the the repository or the GitHub IO for what we were talking about earlier. Um, the, the, yeah, so that's, that's all there. Um, next I want to talk about, uh, we have some submissions and some opportunities to put some things into the world. Um, so I'm going to go over those now. I'm going to go over this. I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to, it'll be in the recording later. So let me. You want me to? Is it something I would have access to, or do you? No, you would not. <laughs> you would not. Okay. okay. Uh, let me do this. All right. So here we go. Uh, so let's see. We we have twenty twenty two, and we have a couple of things that we need to address here. Uh, we have a couple of conferences. I'm always putting conferences on the list. Um, we have multi agent behavior. That's something that already happened. Systems neuroscience by evolutionary theory. Those are these different things that we put in the Slack and, and people can attend them if they want. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'll just put a link to this in the chat. You can follow along. It's this tab 2022. Um, and if you want to follow along, you can do that. Okay. Uh, so we have a, just a couple things I think in here that are outstanding. Uh, Network Neuroscience or uh, NetSci 2022 is coming up uh, this month. And the reason I say this month is because there are a couple of satellites that are happening um, over the course of the month. Uh, Network Neuroscience, which is a, this is line 20 or number 29. This is something that's happening, I think, starting Tuesday. I think it's on Tuesday. And I'm doing a poster there on some work that is predates this group. So I'm gonna, this circuitous connecto modeling, and I just finished the uh, poster yesterday. So I'm gonna do a video of it and put it on the YouTube channel. And this is, but this network neuroscience is a good opportunity for your, uh, you know, to learn some things about networks and neuroscience. I know we have a channel on network neuroscience, and I know Morgan probably is pretty interested in that area. Um, I don't know if it's open to the general public, but uh, I don't know how much it is to register for the conference. It's not that much, but um, but they have, here's the link to the website for network neuroscience. And they usually have like the usual suspects there giving talks on things. So it's uh, nice, 
I think they have network neuroscience at NetSci, and they have it at um, they have another version of it at another meeting. So, do you happen to know Morgan if they have like what the other meeting is where they have that? So, uh, no, I'm sorry, network science or network neuroscience. Oh no, uh, no, no, they uh, another workshop. Yeah, they usually have like a workshop at NetSci, but they also have it, I think, at one of the neuroscience conferences. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, like associated with like SFN or something, or yeah, um, maybe it, um, it might be. Yeah. I think there's something else. There's there's probably something else. Yeah, needed to check all of, all of Swarms's, you know, travel travel plans. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but this is all virtual, yeah. So uh, then there's uh, this SIAM network conference. So this, again, if you're interested in networks, uh, this is actually a little bit less expensive. This is an uh, online conference run by the people at Northwestern. They have a network science group at Northwestern. They do uh, more general network science, not just neuroscience, but the person who's running, one of the people running this net, uh, workshop is a physicist who does networks. And this is a link here if you want it on line 30, if you want to register or see what they're doing. And abstract calls are actually uh, July 28th. So there are a couple weeks if people have ideas if they want to do something. Um, and this is, SIAM is, is the Society for Mathematics. So this, this is something that um, you might find, it's more of a mathematics, from a mathematics standpoint. So. It's, you know, maybe, well, it's probably not going to be that theoretical, but um, because, you know, you have to build the network from something in the real world. So there's always that real world component. Uh, NetSci tends to ha be heavy on like different types of social networks or like social things where they get data from social media, like Twitter, and they get a Twitter API and they get a bunch of data and they make networks out of them. And so that there's that uh, network. Uh, NetSci has a small biological networks contingent, and that's the session I'm in uh, for a main talk that I'm giving. Um, that that that's at the end of the month. But these are two things. If you're interested in network science, these are two things you might want to attend. Um, and the links are in here. Network neuroscience. The NetSci 2022 site. I don't think there's a link to it in here, but um, somewhere uh, else, but I think you can link to NetSci 2022 from the Network Neuroscience link here on line 29. And then uh, there's uh, developmental offloading and critical period and agents, this line 31. So th there's just been a call uh, for the EI workshop to have another ebook for 2022. And we uh, did a paper. Oh. Yeah. So this, this link on mine, or number 31, if you go over, there's a Google Drive link. And we have, final. it says final chapters. And if you go into that, you'll see that there's a chapter 20. And chapter 20 is Metabrains, and that's Jesse and myself. So this is coming out in this ebook that they're making. And so there are a bunch of different topics in it. And it's a good place to kind of shop some of these ideas around that maybe wouldn't make it into a journal or maybe is a little bit more um a little bit unjournal like i guess uh not maybe not ready for a journal or something um but it's but they're having another one of these and the deadline for the main for the rough draft is august 31st so we need to work on this over the summer as well and what i'm thinking is to submit something on developmental offloading and critical periods and agents so this is, uh, you know, we gave a talk this last, in 2022 here for the EI workshop on credit, or on developmental offloading. And we also did a talk uh, at the offloading conference or the offloading workshop in 2021. So we have two, two talks, uh, you know, sequentially. It's, it's more or less the same talk. They're just different things that were stressed in each talk. And, you know, given the audiences, their differences in the in the um, in this. So you have uh, so we have this body of work now. We have two different talks, uh, about twenty minutes a piece, 
And then we have this opportunity to write a paper. And so the paper would then just encapsulate the talks, uh, some of the, lay out some of the issues that the talks raise, and then maybe like, you know, I don't know, implement some sort of, we could implement an agent base model. I don't really know how we would approach that. You don't really need to do that for this uh, type of thing, but you know, just laying out the issues is good. Um, so this would be this developmental AI area where we have developmental AI, uh, we have this topic within developmental AI, which is developmental offloading. Uh, we also have some critical periods aspects of it. Um, and so bringing those all together, you have um, this opportunity to sort of stitch some of these things together. And um, that, that's another one that's coming up. That's August 31st. So um, I don't know if there are any other things we want to put on the list. Um, and I'm sure there probably are, but I don't know. Uh, are there things that people have deadlines for that they want to put on the list? Or I, I just wanted to mention um, uh, NARA Data Without Borders, which is, um, I think it's like July 25th to 28th. Um, and uh, so uh, I'll be there at Janelia Farm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of open what we're working on. So... Um, if, if anybody has good suggestions for, for, you know, things that can get done those days, that'd be, I, I'd be love to talk about it. Yeah. So this uh, is good ideas too, but yeah. Yeah. This is like a hackathon type thing, right? Uh, this is their user days. Okay. So it, it's, oh. um, it's, it's mm. more, um, yeah, I, I think it'll be a bit more uh important you know like i'm gonna say informative i, th I think a hackathon can be informative but yeah informative uh, hackathon. Uh, you know I, I'll, I'll drop a link um um but you know for uh, anybody wants to to um, have a look and um and or, and if anybody wants to talk about uh, things things we could do while we're there or you know while, while i'm there together with uh, also with dandy archive and uh, uh, so it's good good certainly a good place to get uh, get access to um, intracranial recordings animal recordings and you know data sets that um, that would be hard to collect like uh, you know uh, good neuropixels data set yeah yeah so this is something you're going to attend uh, in person or yeah yeah okay yeah oh the connected life conference this is oxford internet institute who put yeah, that on there? um yeah. that that happened i figured we should put it here I, yeah. I don't know if we um talked about it explicitly but this is basically what this is oh right i mean in essence it was it was a collaboration between Avery and I from from the lab and Jenny and uh, and someone Lumi. It's a it's plot which is related. Yeah. Um, and I, maybe not today, but sometime I'll when I do the plot twisters update. I think I think um, I'll go over this. But basically, we at at the event. Um, I'll put I'll put the link here. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I just screwed everything up on my computer all at oh, once. Oh, I see your that ceiling, so that's not good. No. <laughs> A lot of my buttons were pressed at the same time. <laughs> uh, anyway, hi. Um, so, Connected Life there. I'll put it in this thing, too. Uh, are we putting... Um... Where should we put links in the third column or the fourth in, column? In in column E. So yeah, right there. Yeah, let's do that way. Right. Uh, this already happened, so it can be you know green and cool. Um, but basically, what took place is uh, we did we did a we did kind of a demo of um, It was basically a demo, a very early early stage demo of both the map 
and um, we 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 uh, Avery and Jenny worked very hard to complete the map of the land, uh, Twister Land, and and have a big full scale map. And actually, I saw it. Um, Jenny brought it to Chicago, and then there was a few other things that were printed out in the card. So it was basically like a super 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 early like, you know demo demo or die demo at, yeah. at oxford uh, which is pretty cool um and jenny jenny to her credit has been super busy traveling back and forth and here and there she's actually going back she got into dizzy for the storytellers thing and she also got into i don't know if it's also edinburgh um but she got into a master's program as well um somewhere somewhere in the uk um, so she's doing a whole bunch of stuff and it's, it's, she's more like design oriented, um, but also wants to build out these things. Um, but the, the connected life conference was, uh, I, I figured, I figured I should put it on the list just because it's something that we, um, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's relevant and, and it probably should be here. Was it, I think it's July 17th. Oh, no, June 16th. Whoops. Whoa, June 16th. Oh, okay. All of yeah. my... Okay. It's fine. I don't know why. My keyboard seems to be screwing up on me. Oh. I? <laughs> anyway, um, I just wanted to put that there because it's kind of... It's something that we have done and it's kind of cool and relevant. And when we do the plot Tr update, or if Jenny and or Avery come here, we'll, we'll talk about it then. But it, it was basically just a demo of, like showing off the proof of concept and and having some physical, like, you know, making out a map of, of part of the virtual world and explaining what would happen in it, but yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Um, are there any other things we wanted to put on the board before we move on? I feel like there are a few things, but I can't. I can't think of them. Um, I know, like, I wish, I wish, I wish, uh, like, Rashad was here because he he messaged me some stuff, actually on Twitter recently. Um, so I feel like there are, but I, I, you know, I'll have to reach out to to him later. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, he's usually connected with stuff that's interesting. Um, but yeah, that's good. So you know, these this. This is for submissions, but also, you know, events that are online. If you want to participate, it's always good to do that. But if you want to work on something, um, you know, uh, just, again, if you're in the Slack, just raise your hand, as they say, and say, I'm interested in doing this. And um, if anyone has, like, ideas, they can pass them by on the Slack. You know, it's uh, hard to kind of come up with ideas, but that's kind of what we, we want to do here. Because we really want to train people to kind of have big ideas and follow up on them and you know kind of figure out how to do that it's it's not just a you know you can't just do it automatically you have to kind of have an idea then work it through it and so it's really something that is a skill that is not easily learned but it's it's i think important um if you want to see through some of these big issues that we talk about in the meeting so um now the Given that I can't share my screen, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through some other stuff and I'm gonna talk about it and you'll see it in the recording, but I'm not gonna have you're not gonna see it on the screen share. So it's just a glitch for this week. Uh, I'm gonna fix it by next week, so don't worry. Um, so they we have a I know that some of you have joined our uh, Discord and I think in last week's email to the group. I mentioned this Discord, and it's called Principles of Bits to Matter to Mind. And it's it's a Discord that I've repurposed from some VR stuff and a AR stuff that uh, we've been doing in the past. Um, and so now I've just kind of given it a new name. I've added some channels in. I know that Brian has joined and um, a couple other people. Uh, but we have, you know, a couple of channels here that are... Kind of nice discussions, nice discussion threads on uh, things going on in in this world of VR and AR, and um, you know, so 
there's a channel for data sets, which is welcome to data sets. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is like, there are a lot of data sets that we can use for VR. There's like motion capture data where people put on a motion, motion capture suit that has little markers at the joints. And then, you know, you, they film it and they try to extract the, uh, the markers and then they observe the markers moving across time. So you have these, uh, you know, these, these little skeleton animations that move around the screen and they can use the data to like model avatars. So, um, in fact, I think the, the movie Avatar was kind of filmed in that way where they had like, they captured the human motion um, inherent in, in your movements. They put someone in a mocap suit, they put the markers on their joints. They, you know, captured those degrees of freedom and then they map that to an, uh, a digital um, avatar. So they were able to animate things with a more uh, realistic human motion. Um, there are other things, the other, other data sets for VR that might be quite interesting. Um, there's a, I think we had something in the Slack where we talked about, um, I think it's in the, I think I put it in the, we have a channel in the Slack of course as well on VR. And this is this channel, um, See if I can get to it here. Virtual Reality Neurotech. Um, and I'm not sure if there was a nice paper on it. Um, there's a lot of stuff on spatial navigation that's interesting. So if you have data on spatial navigation, that's always useful for uh, sort of informing the design of different uh, virtual spaces. Um, I can't quite put my fingers on this. Uh, on these data sets. There's of course brain imaging data that's inter you know, interesting to know what people are doing when they're in a virtual environment. There's eye tracking data, uh, but there are all these different data sets. And I think if we want to move forward on the VR stuff, we're going to have to have like some data sets. And we've been talking about this with the open source stuff as well, to, to find data that we can train models or at least, you know, tells us something maybe about how to design VR environments or maybe using them to animate VR environments. So there's a lot of possibility. In this Discord, I also want to highlight some of the connections between like VR and AR and, you know, really expand the scope of what we talk about when we talk about VR. So, you know, we can talk about like a totally virtual world, which is like, you know, like a video game, but we also have, uh, uh, augmented reality, so you have augmentation uh, of the real world. You have virtual objects that pop up in a landscape. Uh, then you also have other things like, you know, um, sort of artistic worlds, mixed reality, things like that, that are all kind of in that area. And so one of the goals of this uh, Discord is to kind of think creatively about what those are all those different combinations of things and how we can put them together and understand like virtual virtuality, virtual worlds, human behavior, the mind, all these things. Uh, even, you know, kind of the physics of virtual worlds versus real worlds, which is like a core thing that we don't think about too much. But, you know, if you have a physical object in the real world and you have something in the virtual world, there are of course physical differences in the object. Uh, the way it's displaced, the way it feels, the way it looks even. And then, you know, what are the, what are those differences? Can we simulate them? Can we leverage those differences? Uh, those are the kind of questions I think are really interesting. Um, and I want to leave it to people to kind of come up with new questions. Um, so that's, that's, that's the goal with this discord. Um, and I can send out a, in the, VR channel in the Slack, I can send out an invite to this Discord. It's also on the web, uh, lab website. If you drop down, I have a list of Discords that we run for different topics. And I'm trying to move to some of these Discords. For Like Jesse said, you know, we don't have a developmental AI marketing ploy. So this is kind of a marketing ploy for some of these big initiatives because it's kind of like bringing people into this place that focuses on that thing. And, you know, it, I guess it's a banner or a theme. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I think 
I, I'm kind of glad to see that maybe that'll become more normalized because like I think Discord is better at holding certain like flows of discussion or information. And Slack's great for like project stuff or like like more administrative stuff. But there's the rolling, you know, 10,000 messages thing that kind of eats away at our past. Yeah. That's a big factor, especially for like some of the older stuff that we revisit periodically, like Dev, Dev AI stuff. So having a Discord dedicated, uh, having a server dedicated to, uh, you know, that whole, all that stuff, I think that's a good move. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I think, I think that might even be, I've considered some of that with cognition features and also like my own, some of my own projects too. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want there to be a proliferation of discord servers, but in a sense it's, it's good because if we have these different things, you know, we can use a Slack channel for like things and then we can move to like discord for really detailed work. Uh, if we want to do like, you know, subtopics right. of subtopics. But you can't really do in Slack, but it's um, definitely like if you're trying to build a, like if you want to write a paper, for example, you know, there are places where you can organize this into different subtopics. And, uh, I've never really written a Discord based paper, so I don't, <laughs> but I'm just saying that that's probably, a, you know, that could be useful um, for getting some of these ideas organized, but um, I'm just I'm just trying to you know work on you know I want to work with the Discord and see if this if this is helpful to people and I think with an area like this VR you know this is very useful to integrate some of these things and see especially the V the VR is just like you know very broad or XR I guess is what they call it and just getting all those topics sort of in a row is tough so that's. That's the other thing. And then we have also we have the uh, computational critical periods discord, which has been somewhat uh, lacking for the past number of months. But, you know, we're still posting articles in it. So we have this uh, computational critical periods, which is basically looking at what they call critical periods in development, which are these portions of time in development where you like there's some big change where you acquire a lot of information it has to be there for you to develop normally. Um, there are a lot of different, like their behavioral critical periods and their biochemical critical periods. And we've been posting in this uh, Slack or this, this Discord on different like bibliography topics and different other topics. And I know it kind of has uh, dwindled in terms of uh, the resources, but there are a lot of resources in there. And I know we had Shima, who was an intern this year, who was going to go in and look at it and try to organize it more. But that, I mean, she did some work on it, but then she left. So, um, but I, I still want to go back to that and because there are a lot of resources that we've collected. Now, what do we do with them? Uh, do we, <laughs> you know, it, I think she's wearing an annotated bibliography, which is basically like saying, I have some resources. I want to look at them and put them in order and, uh, but we want to want to make this into something like some sort of academic artifact, like a paper, or you know, apply it to developmental AI. So, sorry, Bradley, where where is uh, a link to this? Maybe I'm. I'm oh, just, I uh, yeah, I don't. Know. I have to. I can send out invites into the Slack. Okay. And I'll just do that after the meeting. Um, sure, sure. It's always hard with Discord. You have to like send an invite, but it's like. <laughs> It's a, yeah. So yeah, there's a there's a which invite is this um, Brian for? for the, um, uh, computational critical periods. Okay, good. Yeah, there we go. Okay. That one. So that's yeah, Morgan, you should join that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So the you know that's the kind of thing you know, kind of like the secondary level of organization where we have these different. Uh, Discord servers and yeah, I definitely think Jesse, you should do one for um, for Cognition Futures. I know you were doing some stuff with Cognition Futures in was it Telegram or something once. I believe. I don't remember. Oh yeah, some time ago I had I had a set of 
updates there. Although it was it was mostly for the the rating group, but yeah. Um, R.I.P. Telegram. I, I wish I wish Telegram became more more popular, but it, it kind of, at least in my spheres, like it there was a big wave, and then it did just. I still love it, but nobody else uses it. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So it's yeah, for, it's quite available. I wanted to follow up on um, something Amanda had um, asked about in in I think cognition features. But um, uh, I checked with uh, um, Jenny at Neosensory, and she says that um, so far nobody has put together a buzz with uh, some sort of neurofeedback for, for mindfulness meditation. But they, they would love to see one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what uh, that would look like, but. <laughs> oh, it, it, you know, you just do like. Um, I mean, you can do it with like a muse and uh, connected to their buzz. And, you know, so it's like, if, you know, you get alpha coherence above this on these, these channels, you know, it, like, then, then, you know, as, as power increases, you know, bumps increase or something like that, like, you know, and okay. um, um, anyway, so yeah. Jenny says that it hasn't been done yet, but uh, but that does seem like it would be actually it, it, there. There's a couple of people at Neurotech X who have been doing recordings with meditators, and I know that that's that that, that that's what they're looking for. I mean, they're looking for the right like guide signal, mm -hmm. right? Um, and yeah, yeah. So uh, see. Um, I mean, that, that'll be interesting too. All right, I took the alpha coherence from, from some people uh, from the, um, I think he's a, a transcendental meditator, um, like a TM person, but he's been doing recordings with like four people meditating together um, okay. as well. So an additional like hyper scanning uh, protocol, but um, yeah, we, we, should, we should make that. And the, there's a great, uh, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this before, but Neosensory has a, um, uh, a community research program. And um, so, I mean, you know, and I'm, I believe, you know, we wouldn't, uh, um, you know, we just need to buy the hardware, which I, you know, is pretty cheap. Like we wouldn't necessarily have to do the um, subscription, um, but yeah. Cool, cool device, and I, I think that would be a, a, a great, um, uh, great first project. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about that. Yeah. Yeah, this seems very cool. Um, I'm interested in hearing about that too. So, uh, wherever you want to talk about oh, that's a cognition. I didn't see it in cognition features, but um, I haven't looked at Slack much this week at all. So, um, definitely. Uh, share more about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. All right. And yeah, like, yeah. Okay. So uh, now, in the last fifteen minutes, or I'm gonna take about fifteen minutes. And again, I can't share my screen for this, but I'll put the papers in the Slack, and it'll be on the recording. And I'm gonna go over some papers that I want to talk about. Um, so let me go to the thing here all right so i did actually find a paper uh, another paper on um let's see if i can find it here another large language two large language models papers that i ran across this week uh that are really interesting actually one is a, a blog post and one is a paper so there's this uh it's it's the cohere blog i think and again, I'll, I'll share this in the Slack after the meeting, but uh, it's a, a post on large language models and where to use them. And so um, over the past few years, large language models have evolved from emerging to mainstream technology. So in this blog post, they would explore some of the common natural language processing use cases. NLP is this uh, form of AI that people use to analyze language. Uh, it's sort of the basis for large language models and they have actually this is part of a two-part series so I just pulled up the the first uh, blog post but 
you can go to the URL and get the second one. So they just kind of walk through what a large language model is, uh, some of the methods that they use here. Uh, then they talk about uh, their Cohere API. So there's this like marketing aspect to it, but you know, it's still interesting. The seven use case categories are generate, summarize, rewrite, extract, search similarity, cluster, and classify. And what that means is they're using these things where you can apply large language models to different problems in language, but they use these words to sort of as operators to say what they're going to do with them. Uh, so but large language models are general purpose models um, and they have a, a large wide range of use cases. So you can use them for many different things, which is nice, but they're going to talk about some of the use cases and, and their, and their uh, drawbacks and their advantages. So from their perspective, you know, there's a, there are a lot of potential use cases for large language models and they're not making any sort of like judgment about like whether it's really, you know, we should we do it or not. It's just kind of like talking about how these use cases fall out. So there are different things like uh, they talk about generate, which is generating words, uh, uh, getting the best out of the generation models, so figuring out like what they can generate and, and how they generate. Uh, then there's completion, which is where you want to complete a sentence or you want to complete a phrase. Then there's uh, prompt, which is where you use a word to prompt some other response. Uh, completion, which is completing a sentence. Uh, rewriting, which is, of course, rewriting a sentence. Uh, completion, which is, uh, again, completing a sentence. Extracting information. Text extraction, where you're extracting things out of a large body of text and getting the key information. So these are all things that are really kind of, um, they don't really rely on meaning too much, although there are some like, you know, if you're generating a, a word or a sentence, you know, if it, if the word has the wrong meaning, then it can be a problem But because we have a lot of words that have multiple meanings. But this is kind of going over some of these use cases. Um, then there's another paper where they kind of talk about a very critical aspect or a critical view on this. And this is a archive paper called Large Language Models Still Can't Plan. And the subtitle is A Benchmark for Large Language Models on Planning and Reasoning about Change. And so this is a group of people out of Arizona State, and they're going to talk about sort of how large language models are kind of hard. It, they have a hard time planning and reasoning about change. So if you're, you know, your language corpus is, is static, you can do all these different types of use cases. You have all these different options. But when the language changes, of course, then you have a problem. Um, and of course, language changes all the time. So this is a problem that we need to think about. Um, so the abstract, um, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here for the recording. The abstract reads, the recent advantages in large language models have transformed the field of natural language processing. From GPT-3 to Palm, your two models, the state-of-the-art performance of natural language tasks is being pushed forward with every new model. Uh, along with natural language abilities, there's been a significant interest in understanding whether such models trained on enormous amounts of data exhibiting reasoning capabilities. And so this is a separate thing from like some of these other tasks I talked about earlier, completing sentences, things like that, because they just draw from that corpus and they make a sort of a prediction. But this is where you have to, re, you know, in, in cases what they're talking about here, you have to reason, you have to make a, a judgment, not just based on a prediction, what the most likely next word is or character. But, uh, you know, if you give them, if you give the model a set of, a scenario, uh, can the model respond positively? Or if there's a change in the language or a change in the meaning even, can this can the language or can the model deal with this change in language? And so this is what they're kind of talking about here. Um, hence, there's been interest in developing benchmarks for various reasoning tasks using LLMs. Uh, and we talked about using LLMs in the case of generating these animate these skeletal animations, the soda play example, the soda race example. Uh, I think it was either well, it was two weeks ago or three weeks ago. 
but they basically use a large language model to simulate these uh, soda racers. And they're these little um, models, these skeletal models of little creatures that walk around or run around or, or locomote or they move in some way. And so you can use LLMs kind of beyond language. But the question is, can they reason? Can they kind of overcome some of these changes in, in the data, input data? Um, however, the current benchmarks are relatively s simplistic and the performance over these benchmarks cannot be used as evidence to support many a times outlandish claims being made about LLM's reasoning capabilities. So we talked about this with respect to the, um, the sort of the sentience argument or debate, uh, whether, you know, large language models are sentient. And of course, we know they're probably not, but this is the kind of claim people are making. As of right now, these benchmarks only represent a very limited set of simple reasoning tasks. And we need to look at more sophisticated reasoning problems if we were to measure the true limits of such LLM-based systems. With the mal motivation, we propose an extensible assessment framework to test the abilities of LLMs on a central aspect of human intelligence, which is reasoning about actions and change. We provide multiple test cases where they are more involved than any of the previously established reasoning benchmarks, and each test case evaluates a certain aspect of reasoning, but actions and change. So they, uh, they show subpar performance on the benchmarks that they give in this paper. Uh, so they have current reasoning benchmarks. There's a state of the art here in the article. They talk about some of these uh, benchmarks that they use, and uh, they have data sets uh, that involve simple math word problems. Uh, they have other ones that involve generic multiple choice and binary yes, no question responses. So these are both things where you have uh, a bunch of symbols that you're kind of trying to manipulate in a sense. Uh, you have to answer yes or no, so you have to make a decision whether something is true or false. You have to generate multiple choice answers, so if the model says, uh, you know, given these conditions, what's the next step? And of course, if you're, if a model is just generating language, it, it won't necessarily do well on that. Uh, there's, sometimes it's obvious what the answer is, sometimes it's not. Um, and so these are things. Um, then there are two symbolic reasoning tasks, last letter concatenation and coin flip, on which LLMs have been evaluated. These tasks, however, are simple in nature and do not really give an insight into the reasoning capability of LLMs. So th this is the thing about like these, these benchmarks. LLMs, although people have said they're sentient or that they've said that they're going to lead us to um, you know, general intelligence, they really don't do well on these type of benchmarks. And these benchmarks, furthermore, are limiting. So we could come up with better benchmarks, uh, but you know, the performance might not even be that good on, on them. So, you know, this is an area I think that's really kind of interesting. First of all, developing benchmarks for this, but also kind of getting the LLMs to do well on these benchmarks, because that's kind of where we want to go is to sort of this reasoning, this reasoning aspect of it. So um, that's, I'm going to, that's all I'm going to talk about for those. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I don't know if we had any questions on that. I wanted to go over a couple more papers, but I think, I don't know if we have time for that. Yeah, we have a little bit of time, but um, did we have any questions? Okay. No, just more, more, more references. These are great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the other thing I wanted to talk about today was, uh, uh, let's see, something called curiosity and artificial curiosity. And I'm gonna just briefly, and again, I'll put these in the Slack. Um, th there are a number of different papers here, but I'm gonna kind of go over them. Maybe I'll go over them in more detail next time. Um, but these are just things I found on, uh, you know, in the course of just kind of, Sometimes I, I find papers over the course of a week and they have like a common theme and I put them in a folder. And so this is what this is. Um, so there is this archive paper um, and this is actually I think from Danny Bassett's group or, or she's involved in it. She's one of the authors. And it's called Curiosity is Filling, Compressing and Reconfiguring Knowledge Networks. So this is about curiosity, computational curiosity. 
And so what they're doing here is they're trying to understand curiosity um, and maybe how it's can be investigated using network theory and knowledge networks. So the abstract reads, curiosity is an internally motivated search for information. It is enduring and open-ended and may have evolved to help us build accurate mental representations of our ever-changing environments. So this is now kind of building on this idea of change and how we deal with change in data sets and things like that. Due to the significant role that curiosity plays in our lives, several theoretical constructs, such as the information gap theory and compression progress theory, have sought to explain how we engage in its practice. According to uh, information gap theory, Curiosity is the drive to acquire information that is missing from our understanding of the world. So like in the large language models, that would be like context or it would be some semantic knowledge. According to the uh, uh, compression progress theory, curiosity is the drive to construct an increasingly parsimonious mental model, which means it's the most efficient mental model you can build. It's Parsimony is like the uh, Occam's razor idea. It's the simplest explanation, but also the most likely and, and most efficient explanation. So increasingly parsimonious mental model of the world. So these are two things that, you know, these are two kind of contradictory things. One is to fill in the missing information. The other is to build an efficient representation of the world. And so maybe those things are at odds, maybe not. Um, to complement the densification process uh, of these two theories, we propose the conformational change theory, wherein we posit that the practice of curiosity results in mental models with marked conceptual flexibility. So this is where you have these flexible concepts built into the model of the world. They help you both interpret things you haven't seen before and interpret, you know, make, make like uh, efficient sort of explanations for them. Uh, to validate these three theories, we must overcome a f the fundamental challenge of constructing formal models of mental representations. Here we address that challenge by formalizing curiosity as the process of building a growing knowledge network. So this is where you use a uh, set of concepts that are connected together as a knowledge network. And so they actually use data acquired from the online encyclopedia Wikipedia. I don't know why you need to say that. but. Uh, they use data from Wikipedia to determine the degree to which each theory explains the growth of knowledge networks built by individual and collectives. So Wikipedia, of course, is a network because you can hyperlink from one concept to another. And so you can build on a network using those data, just using the, the stubs and navigating through uh, associated stubs. And so then you can measure this degree of, of growth of knowledge and how individuals act upon it. Our findings lend support to a pluralistic view of curiosity, whereas intrinsically motivated information acquisition fills knowledge gaps and simultaneously leads to increasingly compressible and flexible knowledge networks. So that's an interesting approach to curiosity as sort of this network of knowledge. And then uh, Jurgen Schmidt-Huber uh, has a blog post on artificial curiosity and creativity since 1990. So Jurgen Schmidt-Huber has been working in AI since the 80s, and a lot of times he'll come on Twitter and say, I did this in the 80s, um, which is, <laughs> you know, which is great, but like, you know, people don't necessarily cite him. You know, it's kind of like, um, uh, what's his name? Um, the guy from Boston University. Anyways, um, sorry, I'm blanking uh, on Grossberg? Yeah, Grossberg. So it's kind of like Grossberg. But uh, so this is like a nice overview of cu artificial curiosity and creativity. Uh, and this, I think these are all Schmidt Huber papers. Uh, like in 1990, there was a paper, Curiosity Through the Principle of gener Generative Adversarial Networks. In 91, there was a paper, Curiosity Through Neural Networks that Maximize Learning Progress. Uh, in 95 and 97, there were papers on reinforcement learning. Um, and adversarial RL agents. Uh, and R then in 2006, there was a paper using reinforcement learning to maximize compression progress. 
like scientists, artists, comedians do. I, I don't know what compression progress is necessarily, but that's the it's in uh, italics. So, um, and then uh, in connect their connections uh, between curiosity and meta learning, and there are other kinds of approaches that are interesting. So, um, so I guess maximizing compression progress is where you compress data about the world and you compress it into these more increasingly efficient representations as you learn more. So as you take in more information about the world, you compress things into this mental model that's more efficient than what you had before. It includes more information about the world. So if I'm you know, looking around my environment and I learn about new things, I can incorporate them into my mental model. It becomes more compact over time as well. So it doesn't just kind of like go off and lead to, to loose ends, although there is that aspect of it where you have loose ends that you want to follow up on, but it helps you complete the circle or, uh, you know, of understanding a lot of times. And that's the idea that, that people are kind of, you know, they put this in mathematical terms, but that's basically the idea. Um, and then there's a, a blog post from Medium on artificial curiosity. Um, and so, you know, kind of discusses this concept uh, a little bit more broadly. Uh, for example, anytime a real scenario where time is a relevant data point, whether that's a simulation, smart power grid, or robotic movements, we can use a class of algorithm called reinforcement learning to learn an optimal policy for an agent so it can achieve a predefined objective. And so we can use reinforcement learning to take a look at some of the ways that artificial curiosity works. So you have this reinforcement learning approach. It kind of walks through reinforcement learning. and But there are two key problems with RL algorithms. One is our sparse rewards. So it takes a while for you to realize a reward. So would you respond to a reward if there's a delayed uh, payoff? And that's a problem in some of our RL models as they exist. There's a, there are also intrinsic rewards, which aren't necessarily something you can realize right away, but they're extrinsic to the context of the, the algorithm. So, you know, we, we think about rewards in RL and we think they're sort of easy to, to understand, but they actually are, uh, you know, there are a lot of rewards in the world that aren't like immediate gratification. So these are things that are important. So, you know, we kind of have to go through this process of artificial curiosity, exploring the environment and seeing what's there and bringing that back to the reward structure. Um, then there's this other paper, how can artificial intelligence become curious? This is actually another medium post on towards data science, uh, claiming that artificial curiosity may be the missing link between machine learning and artificial consciousness. So it follows up on the, on the previous uh, medium post uh, talking about like how, you know, we need to have this artificial curiosity component of our models to sort of drive them forward because there's some things in the world that aren't just in that immediate you know loop or in the immediate training set that we uh, usually use to train our models so uh, in some cases the idea is to reward the system if it finds something unexpected on the other hand such agents should get bored with when facing patterns that are either predictable or inherently unpredictable that second statement may sound weird, but it is not reasonable for the agent to spend lots of time trying to understand how some random event works. So static noise coming from a radio represents a continuous stream of unknown data, but it's, and it's not possible to extract meaningful information out of it. So if your artificial curiosity is just basically where you're trying to explore these things, there may not be a reward for exploring some random pattern or random event and how it works. But if you incorporate artificial curiosity into your model, you can then, you know, sort of use that as a means to get this information without always having to be sort of a, uh, you know, a slave to the reward structure of the algorithm. So your agent can learn things outside of that reward structure or it's incorporated into the reward structure. The reward structure is a little bit uh, different in the way it's implemented. Um, so this curiosity paradigm makes much sense when we put human behavior in perspective. When faced by unknown yet learnable situations, we have an inner motivation to understand it better. So it's a reward in and of itself. 
However, when solving some task that is too simple, or that has already been solved many times, like a repetitive routine like tying your shoes, we feel bored and curiosity is not enough motivation to keep working on it. So there's this trade-off between like some immediate reward uh, and then you know things that are boring or random and there's no reward in like exploring them to find new solutions. So this is where curiosity comes into play. And so that's uh, that's that's sort of this you know this is an area I don't know how 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 many people are in this area but it's it's an area that's in in uh, machine learning in reinforcement learning that's kind of emerging um, and then you know we can go back to the human example here for this last paper the curse of optimism a persistent distraction by novelty and this is on bioarchive actually and this is from a group of people at uh, EPFL in Switzerland. So they're actually brain scientists and computer scientists. And so they're, they're approaching this from a human perspective and they're talking about human curiosity. So the abstract reads, human curiosity has been interpreted as a drive for exploration and modeled by intrinsically motivated reinforcement learning algorithms. So this is how people are interpreting human curiosity in this field of artificial curiosity. An unresolved challenge in machine learning is that these algorithms are prone to distraction by reward independent stochastic stimuli, which means that, you know, like I said, if there's a random thing in the environment that doesn't really have a, a strong reward attached to it, people aren't typically aren't motivated or the agents aren't motivated to solve them or to understand them or to explore them for information, which may be there, but it's not obvious. We ask whether humans exhibit the same distraction pattern in their behavior as the algorithms. So do humans exhibit the same sort of motivation conflict? To answer this question, we design a multi-step decision-making paradigm containing an unknown number of states in a stochastic part of the environment, combined with a reward manipulation that varies optimism of participants regarding the availability of rewards. So this is where people have to believe there's a reward uh, out there. You know, So the idea would be if you don't think there's a reward, uh, then you won't do something. If you think that there's a reward down the road, you, you're motivated to do something. It's kind of like religion where you believe in like a heaven or you believe in a hell and that motivates you to be good in this life. But I don't know, you know, this is like just one example from human culture that we could give. But this is basically the idea um, that there's some reward in the future. Maybe if you go to college and you get an education, that there's some reward afterwards. So it's not immediate. The reward's not immediate, but it's there. Uh, so we show that participants exhibit a persistent distraction by novelty in the stochastic part, which is that this novelty in the stochastic, which is the process that doesn't have a clear reward structure. They exhibit a persistent distraction by novelty. Reward optimism increases this distraction, which means if you believe there's a reward, you're distracted from the task and you explore. And then the persistent distraction is consistent with the predictions of algorithms driven by novelty, but not with optimal algorithms driven by information gain. So this is interesting that uh, this is sort of one of these, if you use an algorithm driven by novelty, and there's a lot of other work in like uh, in um, like the A life literature on this too, where they look at like uh, like neuroevolution and novelty. And uh, I didn't bring those papers up, but those exist. And so there are algorithms driven by novelty, and those actually are consistent with the finding from humans but not necessarily this idea of optimal algorithms driven by information gain. So if you're just operating on information gain in an RL context, that would be the uh, immediate reward. That's actually not consistent with human behavior. Our results suggest that humans use suboptimal but computationally cheap curiosity-driven policies, and policies being these RL policies, but they are the human version of that, for exploration in complex environments. So that's their sort of take on that, that uh, artificial curiosity is something we can model in a agent, that RL is a good approach, but there are other approaches that in, involve this sort of, um, you know, this exploration aspect. 
uh, novel, looking at novelties, not as like distract or looking at novelties, not as like randomness that you should ignore, but something to explore and be distracted by. And then you have, it's not necessarily consistent with gaining information or immediate rewards. There's something else going on there. Delayed rewards. And those are things that we can build into agents perhaps and would help in some of these, uh, you know, acquire some of these types of behaviors. So do we have any questions on that or? I'm interested in the potential of these models for like modeling when that process can like go wrong. Like when you're, I don't know, obsessive or when you're, um, what's the term? Like unusual salience, like when you're paying attention to the wrong things because you're like, I don't know, seeing the potential for a pattern, like maybe there's no reason for you to think that. Um, I guess I'm just wondering how the, the algorithms can be tweaked to model like, um, yeah, abnormal kinds of curiosity. Yeah. So you, you can find this in the computational psychiatry literature. Um, you know, the, the, um, you know, some of some of the tasks that they have will will uh, have have yeah um, like uh, trying to think like investment games that um, are probing like uh, risk aversion things like mm -hmm. that like um, uh, you know not not perfect example but um, uh, uh, but there's definitely there's definitely that that would be the place to look for it. I mean, in particular, because they're specifically using these RL algorithms <laughs> to, to you know, try and capture a, a spectrum. Uh, a... Yeah, that's good. And like on Amanda's point, there's this area of computational pareidolia, which is seeing patterns that don't exist. And like you can mimic this with a, an algorithm People do it all the time, but you can mimic uh, this with an algorithm where it misidentifies things that look like something else or, you know, like um, a pattern in a, in a piece of bread that looks like a person, you know, the sort of things. And so that's an interesting thing. I don't think, and I know people have studied it a little bit, but it's like one of those things, again, that have uh, this connection to real intelligence or biological intelligence that we don't know how to deal with in machines necessarily. So, yeah, we can talk more about this on the Slack. I'll put the papers in the Slack. I'm sorry, but I couldn't share my screen for that, but it's just the text. So, um, yeah, okay. So next week we'll have another meeting. And uh, if you want to, if anyone wants to present, please feel free to, you know, bring your stuff and uh, have a good week. You too. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.